Life is hard. I'm glad for the next part. Life is hard, but God is good. God is good. Say with me, God is good. Praise God. Are you sure of that? Yes. Is there any doubt in anybody else's mind that God is good? Okay. I'm so happy to hear that nobody is doubting that. But you know what? There are people who do. Even some Christians. And I'm not pessimistic, but it's possible that sometime in your life or in my life, we might get to a place where we might doubt the goodness of God. Especially when life falls apart. When life falls apart, which is our topic for today. If people could ask God one question and are sure to get an answer from God, what will be their question? Give you a few seconds to think. Maybe some of you are saying, they, not I, they will ask, how can I be a multimillionaire? Possible. But you know what? That is not the answer of the majority. A survey done by George Barna, the popular Christian pollster, show that the majority will ask, why is there pain and suffering in the world? That is the report, the survey done by Barna. Why is there pain and suffering in the world? Here are some biblical answers. One, people hurt themselves, you and I included by the wrong exercise of their free choice or their free will. Suffering was introduced into the world when Adam and Eve used their free will to sin against God. You know the story, Genesis chapters 2 and 3. When we sin against God, when we sin against ourselves, when we sin against other people, we generate pain and suffering, at least around us. You uh, review your life as I do mine. I know that for a fact. None of us can sin against God. None of us can sin against ourselves. None of us can sin against other people without generating some pain and suffering around us. Let me just give you a concrete example about sinning against ourselves. If you abuse drugs or abuse food, sooner or later you will, you know what happens, right? You will create some painful suffering and experiences for yourself. As a result of sin, there is disorder, there is decay, and there is death in the world that cause pain and suffering. Romans 5.12. Romans 8.22. Actually, Adam and Eve were the first couple who experienced the result of sin in themselves, in their home, and in their family. And the rest of the human family, you and I included, from Adam to us today, we know that to be true. And another possible uh, answer is that Satan, who attacked Adam and Eve, is still attack people today. This is where we are in our text, Job chapters 1 and 2. Now, a major argument used by atheists against the existence of God is a question. Atheists say or ask, if God is love... And if God is all-powerful, why the pain and suffering in the world? Of course, if you have a logical mind, you can connect the dots. 
what the atheist is saying, here is a loving God who has all power to manipulate and control everything in the universe. How come he allows pain and suffering as part of our human experience? My answer is, suffering in the world does not disprove the experience, I should say, the existence of God. But it proves the sinfulness of men and the fallen condition of the world. You know, there are intelligent people around. Those of you who go to university, you know that. And by the way, we are so blessed in this church. Probably 99% of our young people are university students, many of them scholars, fully scholars. So this is a congregation of young people who are motivated to succeed uh, in their lives by preparing themselves through higher education. Knowing that we need to arm our young people with truth so that when they are confronted by the agnostic or the atheist uh, in the classroom, they know what to do. They don't capitulate, they don't bow down, they hold their heads high because they know the truth. So what do we say? What do we say to the atheist who is saying, how can there be a God who is loving and almighty when there is so much pain and suffering in the world? I repeat my answer. Suffering and pain in the world does not disprove the existence, existence of God. It simply proves the sinfulness of men and the fallen condition of the world. Now, another consideration, which is highly biblical and theological. Yes, God is love. Yes, God is almighty. But even this God gave and allowed his one and only son to suffer and die on the cross for sins he did not commit. Have you stopped to think about that? Why did God do that? Because God involved himself in human suffering to provide redemption for you and me. So, yes, there is suffering in the world. But God is not aloof. He joined us in the suffering. He suffered with us. So, so why do you blame the pain and suffering on this God who is loving and almighty, who is, it looks like, allowing pain and suffering in the world? You see, the natural consequence of sin is pain. So when God created Adam and Eve with the power to choose right or wrong, God knew there would be pain and suffering. So he prepared for that. Long back in eternity, the Son was destined to come here and die on the cross for us. Amen? Now, research has shown that there are people who get disappointed with God. That's the key word. Disappointed with God and lose their faith in their times of pain and suffering, although many of these people know that Jesus suffered on the cross for them. This is why a solid biblical theology of suffering is needed to brace our faith in God in times of pain and suffering. More than psychological pep talks, more than feel-good messages, people need in-depth Bible teaching to support their faith in their times of pain and suffering. We need a deep and in-depth theology of suffering which is missing from big ministries today. Listen to the big time talkers on the TV. They are over positive. That's good. But you know, it's not, it's not, it's not always positive. We just read the story or we will read the story uh, about Job, right? So, um, like Jesus and the apostles, we need to teach people sound biblical principles on suffering to help them cope with suffering. Jesus did that over and over and over. Read the Gospels. Apostle Peter actually wrote an entire letter, 1 Peter. James, Jude, all of this, like Jesus, prepared their people, their congregations, for suffering. The biblical, basic, classic, discussion on the subject of suffering, of course, you know, is the book of Job, which provides for us spiritual insights on how to deal with suffering. 
My messages this month are what I call, as you already know, life is hard, but God is good. Today's topic, when life falls apart, based on Job chapters 1 and 2. It's a very long text. It's a story that uh, will really, really get your attention. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. That is what we call a good man. A good man from a Christian point of view, from a biblical point of view. That's a good man. He had seven sons and three daughters. Prolific father produced ten siblings. And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man or the richest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps, my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. He was a good father. A good man, a good father. Keep on reading. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. How do you know you fear God? The answer is there. You shun evil. Don't tell God you fear him and you indulge in sin. Right? Verse 9. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has, meaning he has a ring of protection from you? I cannot touch him. You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your and God accepted the challenge and Job became the battleground between God and Satan without Job knowing it poor Job verse 12 and the Lord said to Satan very well then everything he has is in your hands but on the man himself do not lay a finger meaning you, you cannot be harmed or hurt by Satan without God's permission then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabaeans attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God, insurance people call this the acts of God. The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. I'm just wondering, how did this servant know it was fire from God? He was making up a story, don't you think? Verse 17. While he was still speaking, another servant came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine 
at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind tornado swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are all dead and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. What was the response of Job to all these negative reports? Verse 20. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship. He was a good man. He was a good father. He was a good worshiper. Let's continue. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb. And naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Move to chapter 2. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them to present himself before him. Now, there is a theological issue here. You might, be, you might be thinking or asking, how come Satan was allowed to appear with the good angels uh, in, in heaven? How come? I don't know. Don't ask me because I don't know. When I was in graduate school, this was discussed and nobody knew. Except that uh, my professor uh, at the graduate school, James Carlos, said at that time, Satan was God's prosecutor. Okay, I don't know if he's still the prosecutor today. That's the best answer I could get from my professors. Okay? I don't know why Satan was allowed to appear with the good angels before God. So, um, on another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming through the earth. And going back and forth in it, meaning Satan is not omnipresent, friends. He, he has to roam all over. He cannot be uh, 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 in all places at the same time. If he is here in Pomona, he cannot be in Covina. If he's in Covina, he cannot be here in Pomona. I don't know where he is today. I don't care where he is. Okay. Okay. Then the Lord said to Satan, <laughs> Have you considered my servant Job? You know what? God is bragging about Job. Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. If you and I get that kind of commendation from God, you cannot get it higher than that. Because you cannot cheat God. You cannot fool God. When God says that, that's really true, right? So Satan didn't give up. He continued the debate, skin for skin. Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. He repeated what he said before. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. You cannot kill him. You cannot kill him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job. Who afflicted Job? Satan. Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores, all King James says boils, from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Job was a good man. He was a good father. He, 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 he was a good worshiper, and now we see he was a good husband. He was a good husband. Instead of allowing his depressed wife to rattle him and cause him to give up his faith, he did not. He stood his ground. That's a good husband. 
a good husband. You know, in times of crisis, when the wife gets discouraged, if the husband and the wife get discouraged at the same time, you're done. Somebody must, must stand. Somebody must keep standing up. Right? And, and for us uh, married men, uh, one of the most difficult experiences we will go through is when the wife splits. When the wife gives up, when the wife gets discouraged and says, you are on your own now. You and your God, bye-bye you. It's very hard. But Job did not allow his de depressed wife to affect his faith negatively. That's where we um, end uh, the story. We don't want to go to uh, the story about his friends who went to visit him for seven days. They didn't talk to him because they saw that Job was in pain and they had no words to tell him. Uh, so we will pick it up from there. Right? Okay, so here are some lessons from this long text. Number one, bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to good people. I just said, Job was a good man, and yet a lot of bad things happened to him. Right? When I was 15 years old in the Philippines, I heard a funeral sermon by a Methodist bishop who discussed the question, why do the righteous suffer? Because we are answering the question, why did God allow these good men to suffer? 60 years later, 75 years old now, I still remember the sermon. You know, there are sermons that are unforgettable. Once you hear them, you cannot forget them. So Bishop Fidel Galang, I was still in the Methodist church at the time, said the righteous suffer, number one, because they chose to suffer when they decided to take up their cross and follow Jesus. Do you know, friends, as Christians, some of our sufferings were chosen by us. There are times when you and I could avoid suffering, but for the sake of the faith and the cross, we don't. So why do the righteous suffer? Dr. Garland said, because when they chose to take up their cross and follow Jesus, they chose to suffer. And secondly, he said, the righteous suffer because their righteousness is a gift from God. Therefore, they cannot use their righteousness to exempt them from suffering. They cannot say to God, God, you must, you must see to it. I don't suffer because you see, I'm righteous. And God will say, yes, you are righteous, but your righteousness is my gift to you. Don't use your righteousness as a leverage, okay, to, 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 to be sure I don't allow you to suffer. And thirdly, Dr. Galang said, the righteous suffer to warn the unrighteous that if God allows the righteous to suffer, what more the unrighteous? Back to the story of Job. You know, I already preached two sermons to you. These are four sermons in one. You're getting a good deal this morning. <laughs> Back to the story of Job. Why did God permit Satan to inflict pain and suffering on Job? Possible reasons. To prove to Satan, to prove to demons, to prove to people that it is possible for a believer to suffer and still keep his or her faith in God. Job is a classic exhibit and example that God's followers could suffer in this life without losing their faith in him. Job teaches believers that suffering could be a direct attack of Satan, not necessarily a punishment by God for our sins. Because if you continue reading the book, Job's friends told him that his suffering was a punishment from God for his sins, but they were dead wrong. You see, our friends can misperceive uh, what we're going through. People are very quick to assign something wrong to us. They don't know all the ramifications. They don't know what's behind the trials and the sufferings we go through. They just want to say, there must be something wrong, Job. You have been our mentor. You have been our teacher. And now, see what's happening to you? You must be in the wrong. You must 
have done something and God is punishing you for that. That's Old Testament theology. When something goes wrong, God is upset with you. Not always. In this case, it wasn't Job's fault. Right? He was a good man. He was just chosen as a battleground between God and Satan without his permission or, yes, permission. Now, is there a battle raging between God and Satan and you are the battleground? I don't know. Sometimes I like to think that. You see, are, are, you, are you sometimes <laughs> wondering, why, Lord, why is this happening to me? I don't deserve this, God. I'm upset. Well, you can be uh, upset as you want, as much as you want, but there's nothing you can do about that. If God chose you to be, at the, to be a battleground, thank God for it. It's an honor that everybody is chosen by God to be a battleground between God and Satan. So if you are chosen to be a battleground between God and Satan, God has a lot of confidence in you. Amen? Hallelujah. So, uh, what do we say? Sometimes our reaction to suffering is guilt. Guilt. Thinking that we are suffering because God is punishing us. If we suffer due to our sins, and we know it, examine our heart. Confess our sin to God. Ask God to forgive us and then forsake the sin. And after doing that, keep the peace of God in our hearts. David confessed to God. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I obey your word. Is that on the screen? Not yet? Yet? I repeat it. Psalm 119, verse 67. David said, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I obey your word. I'm trying to strike a very delicate balance here, friends. The delicate balance being your suffering is not necessarily a punishment from God. But at the same time, your suffering could be a result of your going astray. Right? So the second lesson we uh, learn from this story of Job is that nothing bad will be done to you by Satan, by demons, by people without God's permission. Without God's permission. God is still in sovereign control. Satan was only able to attack Job with God's permission. You read it twice. You heard it twice. Chapter 1, chapter 2 of Job. Satan, demons, and people cannot harm us without God's permission. They may point a gun in your head, but that gun will not fire without God's permission. Right? Maybe if somebody points a gun at your head and say, denounce Christ or die, just say, make my day. Go ahead. Reagan's statement. Right? Go ahead. Make my day. Yes, Satan is powerful, but God is all-powerful. God is more powerful than Satan and all his demons combined. So, let us not be afraid of Satan. Let us not be afraid of demons. Let us not be afraid of wicked people because they cannot harm us without God's permission. That's why David said, Again, David is speaking, Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is none. 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 I should fear none. Okay? Pain and suffering are inevitable consequences of living in a fallen world where Everyone can get hurt, good and bad people alike. That is a reality that all of us Christians must accept. We are living in a fallen world where everyone can get hurt, good and bad people alike. Like, for example, last week, Brother Elmer Santos, direct from church, a crazy driver who ran red lights struck their uh, van and just pan around, and the whole family was hurt. But uh, not very badly. So, uh, I just said, in this world, 
everybody can get hurt. Even good people. With God's permission. For us Christians, sometimes God permits us to go through suffering for the following reasons. Because this question is repeating, repeating itself in our minds by now. If I were in your seat, I would ask this question. The question is, <laughs> why does God permit us, why does God permit me to go through suffering? Let me uh, share with you four answers. One, to mature us. To mature us. To mature us in the faith, to mature us as a person, to mature us. Two, to comfort others through the pain and suffering we go through. That's 2 Corinthians, right? 2 Corinthians tell us, uh, Paul tells us that you comfort others through the suffering or the comfort that God has given you in your suffering. And thirdly, to test our faith. Test our faith. Like uh, Abraham was tested, his faith was tested when God asked him to offer up his son Isaac as a burnt offering. And to allow us to appreciate the sufferings of Christ for us. To allow us to appreciate the sufferings of Christ for us. Third lesson we learn from Job. A key to endurance in times of suffering and pain is what? Worship. Worship. A key to endurance in our times of pain and suffering it's not just the Sunday, 10.30 to 12 noon service or worship service here. It is the life of worship. It is the attitude of worship, whether you are in church or outside of church. This is our corporate expression of our personal worship as Christians. But a key to endurance is worship. Job's life suddenly started to completely fall apart. He was worth millions, and suddenly everything that could go wrong went wrong. Within minutes, Job had lost everything due to cattle, rustlers, lightning strikes, robbers, and he had no insurance for his properties that were lost. There were no insurance companies yet at that time, right? One moment, Job was one of the wealthiest men in the East. The next moment, he was penniless. Now, people who had gone through total bankruptcy know the feeling. Maybe there is somebody here who knows the feeling, right? Now, although Job was grieved by his losses, he worshiped God in his suffering. As we just read together, and for emphasis, I'm reading it again, Job 1, verses 20 to 22, at this, meaning after all the bad reports, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship. He said, naked came I from my mother's womb, and naked will I depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. What's this? What do we say when we worship? We're just parroting songs here. We like songs. I enjoy singing. But actually, if you watch your language when you worship, especially if you are in a tight situation, you are going through turmoil and trial and so forth, watch what you say. What you say in the time of pain and suffering will really show you what kind of worshiper you are. Right? Our resolve... To worship God, even when we lose everything, is a key to endurance. Our habit of worshiping God when we are healthy and wealthy will help us endure when we lose our health and our wealth. You see, the preparation comes before the trial. Job was a worshiper before he was tried. He didn't suddenly become a worshiper in the midst of his trial. Actually, a lot of times, it's too late for some people. You don't suddenly become a worshiper when trials and pain and suffering strike you. 
But if you are already a worshiper, before the trial and the pain and the suffering came, you will remain a worshiper. Like Job. Right? Last point. Another lesson from the story of Job. Your experience is not unique. Say with me, my experience is not unique. Okay, that means I'm not the only one going through these uh, tough times. There are other people like me. Okay. Job's suffering went from bad to worst. All his ten children were killed by a tornado. God permitted Satan to attack Job's body with painful sores or boils. His closest family member, his wife, turned against him. Here is a lesson for all of us to learn. Your experience is not unique. That's what Apostle Peter reminds us, 1 Peter 5, where the great Apostle Peter said, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, it prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. What do you do to him? What do you do with Satan when he shows up like a, a roaring toothless lion? Resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. So your suffering, my suffering, is not unique. Others have overcome adversity, so can you? That's good news to me. If Job was able to overcome his adversity by the grace of God, you and I can. Say, you and I can. I can. Okay, you can. Whatever you're suffering now, Job suffered more than you did. Did you lose 10 children? Did you lose all your assets? Did your wife turn against you? Did you lose your health? None of us can say that here, I think. So whatever, whatever you are going through in life now, Job suffered more than you and I. And yet he made it by the grace of God. So can you. Hallelujah. He lost his wealth. He, he lost all his 10 children. He lost his health. And he lost the support of his wife. And here is what he said after all these losses. Job 15, 13, 15. Job 13, 15. Though he, he thought it was God, though God slay me, yet I will hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. Though God slay me, yet I will hope in him. It looks like Job was misunderstanding something, and really he was. For the Paul, at the beginning, uh, we saw that he thought it was God who took away everything from him. And now, secondly, it looks like Job is thinking God is the one killing him. That's misperception. But the point about that is this. Even though he was wrong in his perception, because it wasn't God who was taking away his property, it wasn't God who was taking away his health and wealth and wife away from him, still he said, though God slay me, yet I'll trust him. That's the beauty of that verse. Can we say that? May God help you and me to say that. Because uh, who knows, one day will be a Job. One day will be a Job. But if that day comes, then remember what Job said. Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. So I'll just add one more point to what I just said earlier as to why God allows sufferings. We said to mature us, to comfort others through our pain and suffering, to test our faith, to allow us to appreciate the sufferings of Christ for us. One more point. Another reason could be to keep our focus on heaven. To keep our focus on heaven. Pain keeps our focus on heaven and not on earth. I know this when my wife is very sick. She talks and sings about heaven a lot. And I get scared when I hear her sing and talk about heaven a lot. Because uh, to me, that sounds like he's about to die and go to heaven. You know, I get nervous. And uh, even I, when I had stage 3 cancer and almost died, 
I uh, remember myself singing a lot about heaven. Y you see, when you are in pain and suffering, your mind refocuses from earth to heaven because you, you know you are headed there, right? Okay, so pain reminds us that this world is not our home so that we don't get too comfortable here. Heaven is not our home. Don't get too comfortable here. This could be a reason why God sometimes allows us Christians to suffer, although we may be enjoying a luxurious life, so that we'll be reminded that this is not our final destination. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. If our success, I said if, okay, if our success, or maybe I can say when our success, I hope not, turns into suffering, let us remember. Let us remember bad things happen to good people. Let us remember Satan or people cannot hurt us without God's permission. Let us remember that a key to endurance is worship. And let us remember that your experience of suffering is not unique. In closing, to experience pain and suffering is not the worst thing that can happen to us. It's not the worst thing. You know what the worst thing is? The worst thing is if we resist Christ. The worst thing that can happen to us is to resist Christ. Because God said, Jesus said, Revelation 21, 8, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death according to Jesus. You know, the book of Revelation was Jesus' revelation to John. So this is Jesus uh, speaking. He said, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Hey, Pastor Fred, that's old-time theology. We no longer believe that. That is medieval theology. Lake of fire. People might say that, but Jesus said that, right? If anyone's name was not found written in the book of Charisma Life Church, he was thrown in the lake of fire. No, I just want to awake you. I didn't say, the Bible doesn't say that. Okay. Your name must be written in the book of life. When you get born again, your, your, your name is written in the book of life. Now, but if we have Christ, it is God's promise to us who rely on Him. Revelation 21, 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Let us get assured. Let us rest assured that if our life falls apart, if if our life falls apart, God can put our life together again if our life is entrusted in the hands of God. Music